Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Dental Momentum Podcast powered by Duckett Ladd Dental CPAs and Advisors. Jared Duckett back at you with my business partner, Bill Ladd. And Bill, I love podcasts where we talk about something that we're really passionate about, right? And, that, and I should say that's all our episodes, right? But this one, this one for sure. And I'll, I'll kind of steal the whole, uh, Bill, I think you told me this, the whole Simon Sinek deal. It's a whole lot easier to get up and talk or talk to somebody when you're talking about something. You cheat, right? You talk about something that you're passionate about. And, and today we got a topic we're going to go all the way around and we're extremely passionate about it, uh, including you, I'm sure, Bill, right? Absolutely. And, and I think it's not just that, but it's also a lot more exciting to talk to somebody that's engaging and somebody who literally wrote the book on a topic that both you and I are super passionate about, and that's culture. And Jared, you and I have been part of great cultures. We've been a part of bad cultures, okay cultures, you know, and, and there's just so much, uh, you know, I think so much uncertainty in what that even means. And, and I'm so excited to kind of unpack, you know, with Steve, what this looks like and how he views it and, you know, how you can be very intentional about your culture and, and what that can mean to your practice. Yeah, it's definitely an important thing. And so today with us, guys, we've got Steve Anderson. Steve is a entrepreneur, author, presenter, et cetera. List goes on and on and on. But like Bill said, he, he basically wrote the book on culture called The Culture of Success. So, Steve, we appreciate you joining us today. Hey, good to be with you guys. Thank you. Yeah. So we're, we're just going to dive in. Like Bill said, we've been a part of businesses with with bad culture. We we you know, we constantly are working on culture. And then like we're talking to dental practice owners out there today and, and regarding culture in their practice. So just, just kind of starting off, Steve, let's just dive deep here is how would you really define, you know, what a practice's culture really looks like? So let me give you a, a uh, <clears throat> the most concise definition of culture that, that I know of. Uh, I will not take credit for this. Uh, this actually comes from the late uh, Dr. Clayton Christensen, who taught one of the most popular courses at Harvard Business School and was a, an authority on innovation. And he defined culture as he said, culture is the combination of priorities and processes. Okay, those two things, keywords, priorities and processes and how an organization and everyone in it acts on them daily. All right, so let's, let's just break it down. <clears throat> priority, so a priority is something that we value, right? So we prioritize things every day. We prioritize the things we do. We have values. So what matters to you? That's a big part of your culture, your beliefs, your values, the things that matter most to you. And then processes, so those are the systems that you consciously or unconsciously put in place to reflect your values. So if, you know, in dentistry, for example, uh, depending on how much time and effort you've spent consciously thinking about this, you've put systems in place formally or informally that, that reflect what's important to you, <clears throat> whether it's running on time, whether it's patient service, whether it's community service, whatever it is, the systems you put reflect your values. So priorities and processes. So, and then how you execute. How does everybody in the organization act on those things every day? So those are the three ingredients. It's very, very simple, uh, which is if you want to build a great culture, and let me just say every organization has a culture by design or by default, Every organization has a culture. Your family has a culture. Your marriage has a culture. Your office, the community groups, your PTA organization, every organization has a culture, most by default. Most it just kind of happens and nobody really <clears throat> spends the time, effort, or energy to really think through what kind of a culture do we want to have here. It just kind of happens. And when that happens, the culture is controlled by the strongest person in it. Mm. So if you haven't done anything to define what you want the culture to be, then you've created a vacuum and your culture will be created by the strongest personality in that culture. That may be you, the business owner, or it may be somebody you hmm. hired that has a very strong personality, <clears throat> but that's how they happen by default. I, I hold 
that the best cultures are those that are created by design that you you first look at priorities what matters most to me in the place where i work what matters to me in the interactions that i have with my team members what do i want that to be like what matters to me in terms of how we treat patients so that's number one then number two is what systems are we going to put in place that reflect those values and then question number three is how are we going to build discipline in the system to make sure we execute on those systems as we should every day those are the three steps so i want to back you up here because i think you said something i think is super interesting and we've always heard that every organization has a culture i don't think i've ever heard it put that some develop by default what is what do you tend to see what does that look like and what tends to have people fall into that mentality instead of taking the bull by the horns and actually creating what you want so it so nature abhors a vacuum right i mean one of the the, the subtitle of the, of the book is 10 natural laws for creating the place where everybody wants to work right so there's some some science in this i call them natural laws natural laws are like gravity gravity is a natural law right and you can violate the law but if you're not going to violate it it's going to violate you right i mean there are consequences <laughs> for violating laws and and so 10 natural laws so nature here's a law nature abhors a vacuum right so when there's a vacuum in any whether that's a physical emotional organizational vacuum it's going to get filled in some way, shape, or form. So for example, if I'm the leader of the organization by default, maybe I own it, and, and so I'm the, I'm the default leader, and I hire somebody to be the office manager, right? And I give that person that label, and I say, you know what, I don't know that much about running a business, you just take care of it, then I have just abdicated everything to that person and just say, you know, just take care of that part of the business. And because nature abhors a vacuum, that person will more like, likely than not take over the entire culture and run it the way they want to run it. Well, you're the business owner. Uh, the culture should be to your definition and your liking. It's your deal. So in contrast to the just take care of it, then it would be to bring that person in and say, here's the, here's the kind of culture that we have decided that we want in this business. And it's very, very clearly defined. Here's the parameters. Here's the, the outline of it. Here's the systems we put in place that reflect that culture. Now your job is to run the system. Your job is to, is to do things according to the way that we have designed so that we have the right kind of, of place, the right kind of culture. So when you think about it, patients, let's, let's talk about patients first, then we'll talk about the team. So what is it that patients talk about? When they leave a five-star online review, what do they talk about? Do they talk about the clinical excellence of the dentistry? Do they say Dr. Jones has the most amazing microscopic margins on, on her crowns? I mean, you can't even see them and her shade matching is unparalleled in the, they don't talk about anything like that. What do they talk about? They talk about the service, they talk about the team, they talk about how they were treated, but they rarely do they talk about clinical quality of care. They might talk about the end result, how good it looks, how good it feels, but in terms of clinical process, they're, they're not a judge of that. I wish they were, but they're not. They, what they talk about, they don't use this word. They talk about the culture in the practice, how they felt when they were there. Now, let's go to the team. So the same thing goes for team members is what a team, why do team members stay where they stay in terms of work environment? Yes, the pay is important, but at the end of the day, they stay because it is a healthy, great working environment. They want to be there. They want that culture, right? That's, that's why they stay. That's why they stay engaged. So that's why uh, I have always said that I do not believe in having a patient-centered practice. Now, that might sound like heresy coming from a guy who, who started and runs an organization called Total Patient Service, right? That's our consulting education brand that works with practices all over the world. 
but I don't believe in having a patient-centered practice. Why? Because I've been in too many practices that are patient-centered where the culture and the teamwork is toxic and, and hardly anybody can focus on patient care because of all the background noise going on because the culture is so corrupt. So the first and most important responsibility of patient care is important as it should be. The first priority is to create <clears throat> the right kind of culture where your team members love to work and support each other because when that is intact, then patient care just becomes a natural consequence of that. We can focus on patient care because we've got it dialed in in the back room, right? So those are the priorities for me. It's team first, let's build the culture, let's define that, and then it's that much easier to focus on patient care. So you mentioned, you know, a culture by default and how a majority, I think you said at the beginning, almost a majority of businesses have a culture by default. It might be a silly question, but why, why is that to a degree? Is it because let's, let's talk dentistry here. Is it because the doctor delegates that maybe to the office manager and says, here, take care of this. Or is it because it's too hard or people don't put it high up on a priority list to think about? I mean, why is it that most people just do it by default? All I, think it's this, I think it's the same reason. Let, let me ask you this. Both you guys have kids, right? Yeah. Yeah. Who gave you the owner's manual? <laughs> I'm still right. looking for it. I'm still looking for There's it. There's a doctor's spot book somewhere. No, isn't nobody there? gave us an owner's manual for that deal, but you know, a lot of people do it. It's the same thing, which is, I don't, you know, I don't know how often it happens that somebody sits down and says, okay, you want to have a great culture? Step by step, this is how you do it. It's one of your yeah. highest priorities. I don't think anybody talked about that in dental school. Uh, to say, okay, this is one of the most important things you've got to have in place if you want great patient care, if you want to be successful, if you want to great, deliver a great service, this is the starting point. So I think it's just lack of knowledge and lack of tools to do it. So feeding on that question, when you come into a practice and you see that there is a vacuum, so to speak, and, and there's a culture, but it's really you know, not the culture that's been intentionally designed, what, what kind of characteristics, and maybe you kind of answered it with some of the questions, you know, where there's some infighting or maybe the, the practice just isn't as profitable as it could be. Maybe it's stagnant. What, what are some of the characteristics you would see in a practice that doesn't have an intentionally designed culture of success? So here's, here's how I measure it. And this is a tool for everybody, <clears throat> everybody listening. It's what I call the parking lot meter. Okay, so here's the parking lot meter, is when you show up to the office and, and let's say you're the last one in. Now, I always like to recommend that the leader is one of the first ones in, but let's just say for hypothetical purposes, you're the last one in. So you drive into the parking lot and everybody's car is in the parking lot that works for you. And as you scan that parking lot, because you know what everyone drives, as you scan that parking lot, what emotion does that evoke? So, for example, as you scan the parking lot and you see, oh man, there's that Toyota Celica. Uh, it's going to be a rough day today. <laughs> or, and that's I'm just giving an example. Or, you know, because you know, and we all do this, which is you see For different sure. cars and you know who that represents. And if you have that hesitation, that that pit in the bottom of your stomach, or the whole day, and you go, oh, crap. Here we go again, versus when you scan that parking lot and you're going, man, I can't wait to get in there and, and we're gonna have an amazing day. That's what I call the parking lot meter. That's great. It is, it is, it's intangible, but it is one of the best measures <laughs> that I could give anybody to say, what kind of culture do you have? What is it, you know, because if, if you dread it, <clears throat> if you dread driving into that parking lot, then it's time to go to work on starting from scratch and creating the right kind of culture. Now, if it's great, I would say, bam, then we got work to do because what you need to do is you need to figure out why it's great. We need to codify that and we need to create the structure to make sure we perpetuate it. Having it is one thing, maintaining it mm -hmm. is a whole other thing. Mm. 
That is that is good. I love that parking lot meter scan. <laughs> we we can relate to that, can't we, Jared? Right. <laughs> Everybody feels that viscerally. We we know exactly what you mean there for sure. So so when you talk about you know you, you were talking about an example, if you will, of of delegating it to an office manager. And let's just think solo practice here. You know, one 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 doctor. Do they do they sit by themselves and think, okay, this is the culture I want at my place? Do they just do it by themselves? And and how does that how does it kind of correlate? Maybe, you know, we talk a lot about core values and how they're, you know, really important. How does that marry up with core values in your business? So here's, here's an exercise. Uh, and let me, <clears throat> let me just give you the backstory to this, because this is something I recommend every dentist do. Every business owner should do this. We, several years ago, we moved our company from South Texas in the Texas Hill Country <clears throat> to Dallas, Texas. And there were some strategic reasons we did that. Uh, one of which was center of the country, easy to get, you know, anywhere in the country from Dallas, Texas. So our, our office today is just minutes from the Dallas Fort Worth airport. So we moved the company, uh, moved into a new office, uh, not too dissimilar from what you guys are doing right now, I understand. And <clears throat> one of the first, so we had most of our team came with us. We hired some additional team members. And early on, after we'd moved into the office, uh, we're having our regular weekly meeting that I think at that time was like 7.45 on a Monday morning. And, and so I'm there and, and uh, waiting for everybody to show up and the meeting's at 7.45, right? And so I'm waiting and I got the agenda and we're all ready to go. And I think the first person wandered in, you know, maybe about 7.50 and then a few more straggled in. And we, we finally got started about eight and I'm like ready to blow a gasket, right? Because the meeting was supposed to start at 745. And then I realized maybe the reason everybody showed up when they did, because the leader has done a pretty poor job of setting the standard and laying out what the cultural expectation is. It's my fault. I was leader. So we had the meeting. I didn't say a word about it. And then at the end of that meeting, I took off that day and I created uh, what I later named what I call a culture guide. And the culture guide is a, a reflection of the beliefs and the values, the things that are most important in that culture uh, that everyone is expected to live up to, right? So it's like a the behavioral norms. It's like the code of conduct. If you're going to work here, this is how we work together, right? That's so it's, it was a whole document that I put together. And then we sat down as a team and I said, okay, here's what I did is I tried to do the best I could at writing down what I want the place where I work to be like, how I want to interact with the people I work with, what I want it to be like. And so we're going to go through this and I'd like you to add to it. I'd like you to comment on it. If there are other things that I missed, uh, you're free to suggest those so we can, we can talk about how that fits. But, but I wanted to make sure I was clear on, on what the behavioral expectations are. So that was the first of what now has become something that we do with practices everywhere is create a culture guide. So the behavioral norms of what is expected if you are a member of our team in terms of daily behavior. And so this isn't, this isn't a job description and it's not policies and procedures. It's how we interact. Uh, so I'll give you, I'll give you one uh, as an example of, of one of ones that was in that original culture guide. So there's a phrase that's crept into our vernacular in our culture, our broader culture, that when someone thanks you for doing something or, or someone asks you to do something, more often than not, what you hear as a response is no problem. Yeah. So it's like, hey, thanks so much. And the person says, well, no problem. Well, I always take, I've always taken exception to that because that's a, a double negative response. Mm. No and problem. <laughs> right? So, and you can't focus on the opposite of an idea, which is a whole other topic of conversation, but words create pictures and pictures create emotions and emotions create the culture. And so I've always taken exception to that. And so in the, that original culture guide, one of the things that it, it details out is that 
when someone thanks you for doing something or, or asks you to do something, that the appropriate response is happy to do it. Not no problem, but either my pleasure or, or happy to do it. I'm happy to do it. Well, it's very difficult to say happy to do it with a frown on your face, <laughs> right? And so that's just one little cultural thing. It's cultural DNA that now everybody talks the same language and every place where we've implemented that, it becomes like this code. Like when you say happy to do it, the code that that's code for, I get it. I'm signed on to the culture. I'm playing, I'm all in, right? And everybody just kind of smiles because they know what that means. So that that's an example of one. Another example in the culture guide is if you don't know, don't say. Right? So if somebody asks you something and you don't definitively know the correct answer, don't make it up. Right? Don't, don't make something up and say, well, I think or that. No, you say, I don't know, and I will be happy to research that and get back to you with a correct answer. That's totally acceptable. Right? So it's, a, it's an entire document that details out all those things that make up the culture, little things that we don't think about very much, but that you can define and create your own culture, train your team, and then reinforce that on a daily basis. In fact, we even measure it now. We even have a tool that you can use to measure the health of your culture based on the definition that you've given it. So let, let's talk about going back to that solo practice owner. And, and let's say that they have uh, created this vacuum and let's say, you know, one of their team members stepped up and really that person is not, it's creating that culture that really is contrary to what the owner believes. So, so help us walk through the resistance that person's going to have to have the courage to step out on a limb in front of his team, including the, the uh, uh, one creating the, the, uh, the toxic culture probably and, and, and say, you know, stick the flag in the sand and say, this is who we are. How, how do you give them the, the courage and the permission to do that? Step number one is you're going to apologize. So literally, this is the start of that is to create the culture guide and then sit down first with that person and offer an apology and say, so what I, what I would say is I'd say, Bill, first off, I want to apologize to you. Because when I hired you and brought you into this position, basically I handed you a clean sheet of paper but that was blank and I just said, go do the job. And, and you've done a great job of that. And I fell short because I didn't give you very many guidelines. I didn't give you very many parameters. And that was my shortcoming as a leader and I'm gonna fix that today. Mm. So I sat down and, and I created this culture guide that defines what I want the workplace uh, where we all work, what I, I want it to be like. And I want to go through this with you and I'd love your feedback on, you know, things where you agree, maybe you disagree, maybe you see it differently or things that you'd like to add, but I want to do it with you first. And then I want to roll it out to the rest of the team so that um, everybody is playing by the same set of rules and, and we can have continue to grow the place, this place where we work to be a great place to work. That's the starting point. So I would enlist that person first and either they're going to get on or they're going to get off. I've had it go both ways. Um, some, you know, just say, well, this is a bunch of baloney and I'm, I'm done. <laughs> or the opposite. They'll be, uh, they will be excited that you're stepping up as a leader and taking responsibility and giving them some tools to work with. But yeah, that's your, where it starts. And your other team members will be excited too that you're doing that. You know, 100%. Like, yeah. and, that, and, and not to say, I mean, once you put this in place, it's not to say that everybody's going to be perfect. Everybody falls short. We reinforce it. We have ways you can measure it. You can give feedback. But here's, here's the key. I have never, ever met a team member in any organization that didn't want a great place to work. If you ask anybody, say, do you want to? Yes, I want a great place to work. I mean, when was the last time you, you hired somebody or had an interview and the person said, you know, treat me however you want to treat me, yell at me, <laughs> throw instruments at me, abuse me, just as long as you pay me well, have, it's all fair game. Nobody ever said that. They expect, they expect to be fairly compensated. 
they expect to be respected, and they just kind of naturally expect to work in a great work environment. Yet, nobody, rarely does anybody sit down with a team member and say, okay, if you want a great place to work, here is the work that is required for a great place to work. Rarely do we ever talk about, here's, here's the heavy lifting that has to be done to build and maintain the right kind of work environment. It takes work. It yeah. doesn't happen by accident. Talk about, let's say, picture the dental practice. I'll, another example, let's say rock star hygienist. Say you've got a rock star hygienist, rock star meaning extremely efficient, really good at what they do, but maybe they're not a culture fit. Maybe they're doing something that's that's not in line with the culture and everything that, that, that's trying to be implemented at that practice. How, how e And I know it's easy. It's easy to let that slip because they're a rock star, but what's the downside to letting that person stay around and not addressing it to the culture as a whole? A couple of steps. One, in all fairness, I would ask, have you clearly defined behavioral expectations? Most have not. So that's step one is to do what we just said is clearly define behavioral expectations and give them a, an opportunity to right size it, to turn it around and to get in alignment with what you want. Now, if they won't, then that's the opportunity to sit down and say and do feedback and say, okay, here's what we all decided in terms of what we want. Um, and you know, what's your view of this? Because we, we really want to head in the right direction. Uh, and sometimes it's not a good fit. I would say long term for most organizations that we deal with that a high producer that is not that that will not comply or that will not get on board with the kind of culture you want is costing you more yeah. than you know. Uh, it may not show up on the P&L immediately, but it's going to show up in terms of long-term performance, tenure, uh, retention, uh, patient, it, it, it shows up in different places. You have to dig for it, but it's going to show up. Nobody is that valuable to poison the culture and you just have to put up with it. And we hear it a lot. It's like, well, we, you know, what are we going to do? The patients really love her. And if yeah. we let go, you know, if we let her go, then all the patients are going to leave and the whole deal. Then, then I would have some serious questions about that to say, okay, what's the structure of the practice? What systems do you have in place? How, how do you really have all this organized? If your entire practice is centered around one particular person, then there's some functional things we need to address. So Steve, help us understand because you, you've used, you know, basically the phrasing that makes me think of, you know, accountability in regard to your culture and living by the standards that, that you set. And, and that's something that as we developed out our advisory for our dentists, you know, just the accountability fiscally and some other things that we do, I think it adds a whole value add to our clients. And, and it's something that we really can see a benefit when people are held accountable. You, you've talked about setting up process and structure that creates that kind of accountability. What, what would that look like? That's kind of hard to conceptualize. Okay. All right, so here's here's a piece. This is another this is another vocabulary thing. And I am, I am huge on vocabulary and words because how we describe something creates the culture. So, here's a vocabulary rework. I I don't believe in holding people accountable. Now, I know that probably flies in the face of all the accountability things everybody's ever learned, but when you think about it, would you prefer to work in a culture where you have to hold people accountable? Mm. Or would you rather work in a culture where people are accountable and accountability is built into the structure of the culture? Frankly, I don't want a team member that has to be held accountable. I want one who is accountable, right? In other words, it's when, when I hear that phrase, hold somebody accountable, my vision is a whole room of kindergarten students. <laughs> that I got to micromanage to make sure they do everything that they're supposed to do. Well, I don't want to work in a culture like that. Here's the culture I want to work in <clears throat> is a culture where accountability is part of the culture, where the each team member 
is accountable to the team, not to the owner, not just to mm. the dentist, but to the entire team. So it's part of the structure. Here's the system. So if that's the value, the value is we are accountable. That's part of our character trait. That's a value we hold. Okay, so there's the value, the priority. Now the system, what's the system we have in place to, to put that in place? Well, the system is regular periods of set aside accountability. So what we recommend, for example, weekly team meeting for at least an hour. And part of that team meeting is accountability where everybody checks in for their area of accountability and they report to the team. So each member of the team is accountable to the entire team for their specific area for the results that they are accountable for, for achieving, right? So that's a, that may seem like a minor difference, but it's a huge difference. If I know that I'm going to walk into that meeting every week and, and I am charged with being accountable to the team for my areas of responsibility, that's a whole different culture than me waiting around for the manager to come by and say, Steve, how's it going? You know, how are you doing on, you know, X, Y, Z, the things you're, but that's a totally different culture. So speak just again, always try to put myself in the viewers like listening right now. And they're, they're, they're hearing about all this culture and they're like, man, I know my practice does not have a culture of success. I've got a bad culture in my practice. What, what steps do they start taking? I mean, you mentioned a measurement tool that you have available maybe, but what steps do they start taking to first off realizing that they do have a bad culture, but how do they start setting themselves up to get that culture of success? So I would say first step would be write your own culture guide. In other words, sit down and go through a conscious process of saying, what kind of culture do I want to have? That's, that's step number one. And I, I'm going to make it really easy <laughs> to do this. Now, I don't know. Most people I think are like me. I'm a much better editor than I am creator, right? Me words, <laughs> give me a blank sheet of paper and tell me to write an essay. It's like, uh, but if you give me something that's already been created and say, now fix this to your liking, that's a lot easier. So that original culture guide, I'd be happy to send to anybody who requests it. Um, there's a couple of different ways that you can get it. One is <clears throat> you guys mentioned, you know, I wrote the book on this. It's called the culture of success, the original culture guide and all 10 natural laws are in that book. And it's very easy to, to get it. It's, it's uh, the website is the culture of success book.com. So the culture of success book.com and you can, you can, the book is available in print uh digitally or audio version whichever way you like so that and, and the culture guide is in there you can plagiarize to your heart's content so that would be one and then number two um i would i would offer to anybody who's listening today if you'll just email us at answers at totalpatientservice.com so answers at totalpatientservice.com and just put culture guide in the in the subject line just mention this podcast, then our team will just send, will send you a copy of that original culture guide. And like I said, you can use it word for word if you want. Uh, it is open to be plagiarized and used or crafted. You can take pieces of it, add your own, but it'll give you at least a starting point to, to craft your own culture in writing so that you have a starting point. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, it's, and again, I mean, don't recreate the wheel. I'm like you, Steve. If you gave me a blank piece of paper, I'd scratch my head for five minutes. But have <laughs> something to start with, it's, it's invaluable, in my opinion. Yeah, and I'll, I'll jump in and say, it, it's funny, Jerry, we started this conversation saying how dialed in we, we were and, and, you know, pride cometh before the fall because, Steve, you're 100% right and you've opened my eyes that little phrases have significance and, and how you say things and how you do things is it the perception could be there for the team um and and that's something that we can all learn we can all get better you know your your culture it, it's a living breathing creature that that is always evolving right i mean it's not something that you do once as an initiative you roll it out you put stuff on the wall and then you never think about it again yeah so there you know there's a process creating it first 
uh, in, in terms of in writing, getting it down on paper, that's the first step, rolling it out to your team and then maintaining it, right? You've got to reinforce it on a regular basis. We recommend uh, in every morning meeting that, that you end your morning meeting just by, by taking 15 seconds and reviewing one item on your culture guide as a reminder to everybody of yeah. what, what behavior is expected. We hire with it. So you, you give the entire culture guide to a potential new hire and say, this is the kind of culture that we're committed to. We don't hit it out of the park every single time, but, but this is what we strive for. So if we invite you onto our team, this is gonna be the expectation that, that we're all striving for and we would expect you to strive for as well. And I'll tell you what, it is a great, it's a magnet because the right kind of people, when they read that, they're gonna go, man, this is, this is the kind of place that I've always wanted to work. And this is the first place that's ever had it defined this clearly. Yeah, if you would have asked me, well, I'm gonna tell on myself, if you would have asked me five, six, seven years ago about culture in a business, I mean, I'll be honest. I would have been like, oh, come on, guys, we got to work. You know, it's we're here to work culture that that comes later. But you guys realize listening to this interview right here, the culture, I mean, it literally is the heartbeat of your business. Yeah. It is who you are. And it is so important in any business. So if, like literally you're listening out there and you're thinking, man, my culture's not very good. I mean, get with Steve. I mean, he can help you guys see how passionate he is about this. I mean, we could talk all day long about this specific subject. Um, but Steve, tell us just a little bit before we go, tell us, tell us what you're doing right now. I introed you, you know, you're, you're an entrepreneur, you're an author, you're a presenter. What, you've got all kinds of things going on and, and you're passionate about a lot of things. What do you got shaking right now, really? And what are you extremely passionate about that you're working on? So I, I appreciate the, the question. So, uh, you know, my, my career has, revolved around dentistry. Uh, I'm not a dentist. We joke that I play one on TV. Um, and, but there's a, there's a reason I do what I do is I am passionate about dentistry. Um, dentistry found us and, and then it changed my life. And that's a whole other story. Dentistry literally saved my life. And so I, I've got a big why in terms of why, why I'm so passionate, not just about culture, but why I'm passionate about dentistry. So to that end, um, at Total Patient Service, which is our education consulting brand, we have a whole series of programs in training as well as on-site, in-person work that we do with dental teams. On, and it's all centered around one word. And that word is yes, is how do you create the kind of culture where you hear yes more often from your patients? How do you present things in a way that's understandable for patients so that they are more apt to accept the treatment that they really need? Uh, so that, that entire brand, that is its entire focus is the skills, the systems, the ideas, the techniques for hearing yes more often from your patients. Our Crown Council organization that was originally an outgrowth of that training is committed to one word, and that word is culture, which is helping you build and maintain a culture of success in your practice. So that organization is filled with all kinds of resources uh, that will help practices create and maintain a culture of success. And part of that culture is one of our big beliefs is that a big part of a culture of success is, is what we call doing good. Now here's another, Bill, here's another word problem for you. Uh, there's a, a phrase that's crept into our vernacular of giving back, right? We talk about organizations that give back. Well, let's think about that. If you're giving something back, you had to take it <laughs> in the first place. And so it's a misnomer. I mean, it's almost like somebody must have coined that giving back thing because they felt guilty about making a profit. I don't know, but I think it creates, it's the wrong image. So we, we like to, to categorize, to describe those kind of efforts as doing good. And there's a lot that we do to do good. And one of the things that we do to do good in the Crown Council is what has become the largest charitable campaign in dentistry called Smiles for Life. 
that has raised now over $45 million for wow. children's charities all over the world. And all of that money has been raised in dental practices. It is one of the most powerful cause-related marketing campaigns in dentistry. Uh, I won't belabor all that, but um, if you want a, a powerful new patient generator that does good in your community and in the world, uh, talk to us about Smiles for Life. You can, uh, you can take a look at crowncouncil.com. So crowncouncil.com uh, will walk you through the entire, all the things that we do, not only in the Crown Council, but what Smiles for Life is, is all about. It's a powerful, powerful practice builder that also does a tremendous amount of good uh, all over the world. So those are just a few things. Yeah, that's awesome. As you guys can see, I mean, Steve's got a lot of stuff going on and specifically he can help you in a lot of different places, you know, in your dental practice. So Steve, I want I want you to end on one question we always ask. So we're, we're here, I'll date this a little bit. We're at the end of 2020 almost. Yeah. All right. So what, what's that one thing you would give dental practice owners right now? What piece of advice would you give them to start gaining momentum in their practice? One thing, take care of the goose. Now, you all remember Aesop's fable about the goose and the golden egg, yep. right? Everybody remembers that story. The, the farmer, you know, destitute, uh, almost nothing left. And he goes out and his prize goose has, has laid this golden egg and he takes it to the assayer who examines it and determines it's solid gold. You know, so overnight he has, uh, his net worth is increased, guys. <laughs> his right. balance sheet went up a little bit. <laughs> And then the next morning, the same thing and the same thing. So he's phenomenally wealthy in a short period of time. And then he gets this idea that if he kills the goose, then he can get all the golden eggs at once and he won't have to wait for the daily ration. And then of course, everybody knows the end of the story. So he kills the goose and slices it open. And of course, there are no golden eggs because the value is in the goose's ability to produce. It's not in the goose itself. It's the goose's ability to work and produce and make something happen on a daily basis. You are the goose, especially in dentistry, you're it. And especially with everything that's happened this year, it is a perfect time to sit down and re-examine what you need to do to be healthy physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, what do you have to do on a daily basis, on a regular basis to take care of the goose? You're it. You are the most valuable asset that you have in your business. You're it. And, and so if it were any other asset, the chair, the x-ray machine, the computers, you'd have a maintenance schedule. You'd, you'd have a way that you, you insure it. You do all these things to take care of it. You're the most valuable asset. And then your team is the next most valuable asset. And so now we've come full circle, is your culture is what takes care of you and your team. So it's high time to sit down and say, what do we need to do to take care of the goose and creating a culture of success is just one of those things you can do to do that. Mm, I love that. I literally take care of the goose, right? I literally heard something just a couple of days ago, silly analogy, but you kind of hit on it. You know, you get your oil change in your car so many times a year. How many times you actually sit down to take care of yourself, yeah. make sure that maintenance yeah. plan. I love it. Take care of the goose next year. I mean, figure out what that goose wants to do. I mean, unbelievable. Steve, I appreciate you joining us, man. You hey, are happy to do it. Thank you for the invitation. And I'll just, just as a quick, uh, quick summary, uh, if you like the culture guide, just email us at answers at totalpatientservice.com. Culture guide in the subject line, mention this podcast. Uh, a copy of the book, theculturofsuccessbook.com. And uh, Smiles for Life, uh, just uh, uh, go to crowncouncil.com and uh, it'll lay the whole thing out for you. Yeah, I love it. We'll pull all that stuff in the show notes so they can reach out. You know, got all your contact information. So, uh, guys out there, I appreciate you guys listening. As always, I asked the double S double R if you could go out there, share this podcast. Somebody, I guarantee you, somebody needs Absolutely. to hear exactly what Steve had to say today. You got a colleague, you got a friend, whomever, share this podcast with them. Subscribe to our podcast if you haven't. 
leave us a re rating. I mean, Steve knocks this one out of the park and leave us a review. So guys, as always, appreciate you listening in. You guys make it a great week. We'll talk to you guys soon.